We're looking at part 50, and thou preparest a table before me in our series on wild harvest edibles. <clears throat> and uh, as we begin that, just as a reminder that if there's any, um, any suggestions on therapeutic intervention, that as you navigate any health challenge, it's always recommended that you partner with a medical practitioner that shares your philosophy of care of the human body and in disease and health. <clears throat> the information shared in this presentation is, is meant to be an educational uh, tool in your toolbox. And uh, just make sure that any procedure or protocol is thoroughly investigated before <clears throat> using it uh, yourself without doing any due diligence. Thomas Edison said that the doctor of the future will give no medicine, but will instruct his patient in the care of the human frame in diet and in the cause and prevention of disease. And back in 1885, <clears throat> Ann White made the statement in Councils on Diets and Foods and Testimonies for the Church that there are many ways of practicing the healing art, but there's only one way that heaven approves. God's remedies are the simple agencies of nature that will not tax or debilitate the system through their powerful properties, pure air and water, cleanliness, a proper diet, purity of life, and a firm trust in God are remedies for which the want of thousands are dying. <clears throat> Yet these remedies are going out of date because their skillful use requires work that the people do not appreciate. Fresh air, exercise, pure water, and clean, sweet premises are within the reach of all with but little expense. But drugs are expensive, both in the outlay of means and the effect produced upon the system. <clears throat> 3 John 1 verse 2 stated, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health, just as your soul prospers. And Paul in Romans 12, 1 and 2 said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, <clears throat> that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that may, you may prove what is that good, <clears throat> that acceptable, and perfect will of God. So great words to remind us of, of our duty and also of the way to approach our, our health and wellness. Tonight, our, our first topic is the, the chuga sedge. Uh, sedges are an interesting class of plants. Uh, Cypress esculentes is the specific sedge that we have in mind. It's also known as <clears throat> yellow nut sedge or tiger nut. And there's a diagram on the right there that shows the, the sedge growing up has some basal leaves and roots with some nodules on it. And the, uh, the flower heads <clears throat> look more like a grass, but sedges are kind of their own, their own class of, of plant. They're fairly fast growing sedges and they like moist sites. They can grow up to two feet tall. Um, they're often confused with the purple nut sedge. <clears throat> so the purple nut sedge is on the bottom and the yellow nut sedges on the right. Uh, you can see that their tops are distinctly different. They both have the edible portions. They're both edible, uh, but the, the yellow nut sedge happens to be the more palatable of the two uh, species. <clears throat> so the flower, there's 10 to 20 of them on a given stalk or spikelet. You can see them uh, up, up in the top portion of the, in the diagram. The spikelets come off at 90 degrees. 90 degree angles coming out from the, from the main stem <clears throat> and they become very swollen and mature as they mature and, and brown. The leaf itself is kind of V-shaped. So it has a, a deep V uh, profile if you were to cut it uh, longitudinally or, la or laterally, <clears throat> cross-sectionally. Um, and it has a bright yellowish green tinge to it. The, you can see the basal stems are gonna be uh, yellowish green. They alternate out of the out of the basal rosette, you can see that it actually grows in beds. Uh, in the diagram, you see to, just to the left there, a small plant growing up. <clears throat> so they spread by their underground roots as well as by their, their nodules. And their, their leaves are basal and alternate, and there's three to 10 stems, uh, stem leaves in, in the basal arrangement. So remember that a very quick way to tell if a sedge is a sedge is that sedges have edges. The stems are triangular in shape, and they're very um, pronounced. So if you're to cut it in, in a cross section, it would be a triangle. Um, sedges have edges, rushes are round. So there's different types of rushes and they're all gonna be round. There's not gonna be any interruptions on their stems <clears throat> on the way up. Uh, <clears throat> so rushes are round. 
and grasses have joints that go down to the ground. So the grass stems are jointed, uh, so that they're round, but they have joints that interrupt them or knuckles as you would uh, follow them from the, from the ground up to their top. So sedges have edges, rushes are round, and grasses have joints down to the ground. Just a good quick little rhyme to remember what is a sedge. So the thing that's edible is the nut-shaped tubers that are underneath the ground. You can see on the lower right picture that there is a mass of the yellow nut sedge that has been pulled up and there's lots of those <coughs> um, ground almonds that are present there or the, the tiger nuts they're sometimes called. <coughs> They're little tuber-like nodules and they're, they're nutty and sweet flavored. They can be eaten just straight, raw. So wash them, you can rub the papery skin off and, and just eat them raw. Or you can cook them and you can cook them uh, uh, like a potato. Uh, you can dry them, you can bake them. They're really tiny, as you can see in the hand there, uh, but you can, and then you can grind them into a powder and that powder can be used as a flour and a milk substitute. So these can grow in quite dense beds. And so you could collect <clears throat> a fair quantity, quantity of them in a fairly short order if you found them growing in the nice, a nice colony. So typically they're used as a vegetable, like a potato added into soups and stews to give body texture and nourishment to it. It can also be candied and used as a confection. <clears throat> so typically harvest those in late fall or early winter <clears throat> after they flowered and towards the end of the season. And then you can pull them up in the bunches and, and extract those uh, root nodules. <clears throat> so they can be, if the soil is loose, just, just pull them up and they're just right there. The chufa nuts is what they're sometimes called, hang onto the roots of the plant and it just can be pulled off and then washed and um, husked essentially. <clears throat> So sometimes they're referred to as tiger nuts. Uh, so the chufa crunch snack, you would collect them, trim them and clean them. And those are the chufa nutlets <clears throat> and then boil them in salted water for about half an hour and let them dry. Um, you can dry roast them and then add a seasoning of choice to give them some additional flavor um, if you wish. <clears throat> and there's uh, <clears throat> a number of different ways that one can eat, eat these. We talked about them being baked and cooked and <clears throat> used in soups and stews. You can see on the lower uh, kind of mid left picture there, there's a milk, the raw nuts and the flour that's been made from the chufa nuts. <clears throat> and there's some pancakes here that have been made from the flour of the chufa nut. So it's, it's useful in that regard. <clears throat> and it's actually sold commercially. You can find it online, probably even locally. I don't know, I haven't looked locally, but <clears throat> I found a number of different places where one could, could obtain it. Uh, and purchase it online in various forms. <clears throat> so the chufa, the chufa flour. And that again, you can make with a mortar and pestle or a, a, a grist mill of some nature, <clears throat> a grinding apparatus to grind it into a powder from the prepared chufa nuts. So the range of the chufa is quite broad all across North America, except for Montana and looks like Wyoming there. <clears throat> Uh, and the central provinces of Canada, but all across the United States, they can grow. Uh, they have a variety of medicinal benefits that may help um, digestion issues and, and thirst, but they function as uh, an aphrodisiac. Uh, they can be a, a carminative, which is helps in gas relief uh, for, for flatulence, a diuretic, which increases urine flow and kidney function, and a menagogue, which helps to increase menstrual flow if someone's having a, a disrupted period, um, that can help bring things back into regularity <clears throat> as a stimulant, uh, and a tonic. So a tonic is something that, that uh, generally tends towards health, uh, not rapidly, but over time. <clears throat> and from a stimulant perspective, it's not like a, like a pharmaceutical uh, grade um, drug or narcotic that would have a rapid, profound effect, uh, has a, a more subtle, sustained effect. <clears throat> it's actually actually also used in erivitic medicine, uh, again, as a flatulence treatment for gas, like a carminative, um, indigestion, colic, and dysentery. So it's very, uh, got dysentery there twice, and diarrhea. So GI tract uh, disruptions can be benefited by using chufa. And also excessive thirst can be mitigated by, uh, by using chufa, which 
polydipsia is a term that's used for, for lots, drinking lots of water. And typically that's a classic sign of, of diabetes, polydipsia, polyuria, making lots of urine and drinking lots of water, just being constantly thirsty for no apparent reason. And <clears throat> so it made me wonder if this might be beneficial for, for diabetics and helping to mitigate uh, the symptoms of, of diabetes perhaps. I uh, didn't see anything like that in the literature, but that was what uh, first came to mind when I saw that uh, it had a benefit for excessive thirst. Our next plant that we'll look at is the common reed. The common reed is known as Phragmites australis. And you can see that it uh, can grow quite tall. You see the person in the picture here is standing in a row uh, between the common reed can grow up to 20 feet tall. So that's, that's a really tall, tall plant. Uh, it can grow in, it does grow in moist areas. It can grow very rapidly. It's uh, very stout and erect, has unbranching stems, it can grow in shallow water. So it's rhizomes and roots can be completely covered by water. <clears throat> so that tells you that it's going to be in a wet environment like cattails and other things. And <clears throat> will take some dewing and getting muddy and wet to actually harvest it. Uh, but it has uh, a growth pattern of high density. It actually is noted in some places as being invasive. Uh, so it has a, a propensity to spread and grow in large, large densities. So that can be beneficial from a harvest standpoint if it's in a food sustaining role. <clears throat> so colonies of the reed have been known to, to raft up and float on, on water bodies. Uh, it has horizontal runners. They can, they can uh, penetrate and spread over a square kilometer. Kind of like if you think about an aspen tree or an aspen grove, aspen groves can be clonal. In fact, many of them are clonal, uh, just underground roots pop up in a tree and they can be over quite extensive areas. And there are other plants that have that similar characteristic. <clears throat> so the rhizomes individually can be 20 feet in length. <clears throat> so it flowers from bloom uh, from uh, uh, July to September. You can see what those flowers look like. They're basically just a, a spike in the top of the the reed, it's not a flower like we would think of as an, as an angiosperm, which is a nice, nice showy flower with petals, <clears throat> but more of a grass-like uh, flower, even though it's not a grass, it's considered a reed. <clears throat> and reeds are different than rushes uh, and they're different than grasses. Uh, they have a pithy central core. Uh, a reed may be hollow uh, <clears throat> and a, a, actually a, a rush may be hollow, but reeds are going to have a pithy core, uh, but they don't have knuckles and joints on them like we see in grasses. So they have bushy spikes that can be 20 inches in length at the top. And when they're young, they're purple and kind of tend to a, a, turn to a straw color as, <clears throat> as they age. So the leaves are bright green and they're rolled around in the shoot as they grow up and can be 25 inches long and two inches wide. So the part that is edible in the common reed um, are the seeds, the leaves, the stems, and the roots. <clears throat> and again, this, this is in some places is considered an invasive species. As I was researching this some more, found that there are actually places dedicated to its eradication. Uh, so it probably has a capacity to outcompete native vegetation of a similar nature. <clears throat> and so some places are attempting to to actually eradicate it. You'd wanna be somewhat cognizant of that if possible in the areas that you might choose to harvest. Uh, just, I don't know what the mechanisms of eradication are, if it's all physical eradication or if they use some chemical eradication because that could have some long lasting environmental effects as well as have some physical detrimental effects if one were to consume the, <clears throat> the reed products um, in an area that was treated with chemicals. <clears throat> So harvesting the, uh, the common reed, <clears throat> you want to harvest the roots and the young shoots in early spring before the stems and leaves appear. You can see on the right, the shoots coming up off of the, the rhizome there <clears throat> and some young shoots on the left. They're probably about the size of your finger uh, or smaller depending on, on where it's growing. <clears throat> the shoots are, are nice and tender. They can eat them raw or cooked. Looks like you could probably eat a little bit like asparagus. Uh, the roots are sweet and best when they're young. 
and you can eat them raw or cooked like a potato. So you can see the, the rhizome or the root down below there. Similar in nature to, but much larger than <clears throat> something like uh, uh, eelgrass in, in the water in the marine environment. It has a, a sugar cane like uh, stem to it. I don't think this has as much sugar in it as we would see in sugar cane or in eelgrass, um, but it has that uh, similar rhizomatic appearance. <clears throat> So the stems and the leaves would be harvested later uh, on through the growing season. The seeds, they shed in winter. And while the harvest may be tedious, they're actually fairly high in nutrition. And they can be ground into a, a, into a flower substitute. So the plant, the stem in particular of the, of the reed, when it's wounded or cut off, it gives off a licorice flavored sweet sugar, kind of gelatinous sap. Uh, that can be eaten raw, or it can be used in cooking as a sweetener, as a natural sweetener. Uh, so the traditional use of, of that was that they would allow it to become tacky and harden and roll it into a ball. They could store it in that ball and extricate and chop off portions of it for use as needed, uh, and or just use it as a, as a candy that could be eaten to satisfy a sweet tooth. <clears throat> so here's a tub of the collected roots with uh, the mud that's still present on them. Uh, you can see how they progress up through an environment uh, there on the upper right diagram with uh, the common reed in various different uh, presentations in very moist areas as well as actually with submerged roots. <clears throat> you can make a candy out of them, so cut the stems and you can allow the sugar to be released. You can see the stems there in that, that very tall group. If there was a person standing in there, they're probably about halfway up the height of, of the reed. And it releases a licorice flavor, flavored gum, and then roll that into a ball and eat it or flavor, use it to, use it to flavor uh, other, other edible food substances. <clears throat> so it can add a dimension of, of sweetness or flavor to things that you might be eating like uh, some of the probably indispensable things that you might be able to find would be like onions and the allium family and garlics and leeks. Uh, those would be indispensable as far as just being able to add, add flavor to uh, the various dishes and keep them from being too bland. Of course, eating in the wild, you may also wish to cultivate a taste for bitters. From a medicinal standpoint, <clears throat> It's very good for uh, respiratory and digestive and skin issues. And you can see that this has a distribution all across the United States and Canada. <clears throat> Doesn't mean it grows everywhere. The, con the conditions have to be right. If you think about cattails and where they grow, they don't grow everywhere. They don't grow in your front yard, um, but they are in every state of the union <clears throat> as well as all the provinces of Canada given the right environment for their, their growth. Even in Hawaii, it appears. <clears throat> So the leaves are beneficial for bronchitis and cholera. Uh, <clears throat> the leaf ash, so if you were to take the leaves and burn them and keep the ash, they can be applied to, to foul sores. A decoction of the flower to the top flower part, uh, you would take that and boil it in water over a period of time to have a water extraction of the, of the flowers. And it's helpful for, in cholera again and food poisoning. The ash again of the, the flower ash, helps to stop bleeding as a styptic. <clears throat> and the stem can be an antidote for poisoning, uh, can be a cough relief, uh, a vomiting relief uh, treatment, a, a detoxification and purifying uh, herb, an antipyretic, so a fever reducer, and a refrigerant having cooling effect. So both of those can kind of work together <clears throat> If, uh, if there's a, a fever situation, the refrigerant has a cooling effect and the antipyretic helps to bring the, bring the fevers down. <clears throat> I believe that cattail has some similar properties. A lithanthropic, so litho, litho means rock and essentially it helps to dissolve kidney and bladder stones. So that can be helpful in that regard, <clears throat> especially in the field. Although I would imagine that someone in the field 
who have been in the field for some time would probably be less likely to have kidney stones or bladder stones than someone who's eating a Western diet on a regular basis, a traditional standard American diet. <clears throat> uh, but nonetheless, if you got out there and had those issues arise, you would be able to uh, mitigate their pain and help to dissolve them and get them passed through. A syllagogue helps to promote salivation. Uh, a diuretic promotes urine uh, production and kidney function. And a stomachic helps to aid just general appetite and digestion. Sometimes people lose their appetite for various reasons, and this can help to stimulate the appetite, uh, maybe not from its actual just flavor enhancement and tastes, but simply from um, an, uh, uh, a hormonal uh, endocrine level of stimulation of hunger. So it can be used internally and externally. So internally, its usages are helpful for diarrhea, for fevers, vomiting, coughs, for helping to break up a thick, dark phlegm, uh, lung abscesses, uh, so that <clears throat> is helpful, uh, urinary tract infections, UTIs, and food poisoning. And that's often coming from, from seafood. So steering away from seafood would be helpful in mitigating that as a source of uh, food poisoning. Externally, mix it with gypsum and then apply it orally for bad breath uh, and, and toothache. So it can be helpful for that. So looking for a little bit more uh, uh, activity, uh, found a, an article from the Future of Microbiology <clears throat> by Delfino et al. back in March, 2021, <clears throat> just last year, looking at the antibacterial activity of bacteria isolated from the common reed against multi-drug resistant human pathogens. So this is an important area to, to go into and look at uh, because there are so many different drug resistant pathogens that are raising their heads in uh, our world today. And they found that the bacteria that was isolated from this uh, reed actually had the capacity to uh, inhibit the growth of most of the strains it was tested against. Uh, which were 35 different antibiotic resistant strains that were collected from a variety of sources from, from uh, patients and hospital settings and various other settings of known antibiotic resistant bacteria. So that's nice to know because those could be encountered in a, in a setting where you wouldn't have the traditional antibiotic cocktails available. And if you're able to use something that, that God provided in nature, it would be to your benefit. And God has provided everything for our benefit in nature. And most, if not all, the pharmaceutical uh, approaches to uh, <clears throat> physio physiological altering have been derived from the natural products that God have made. And their actions have been enhanced <clears throat> through uh, mimicking the, uh, the molecules that have been found in nature and making them in such a way that they can be patented in most cases. Um, so the natural, naturally occurring molecules that God created are designed to function at a level that is, that is most beneficial. So that's looking at the common read and at the Chufa sedge. And if you'd like to review these in a future time or share it with somebody else, you can go to www.preparingforthetimeoftrouble.com.